see. But the story, no, no hold on. You got to remember, it, uh, Ibn Ishaq uh, is a historian. He, and he would have spoken to um, the people who knew uh, because the hadith tradition was already alive, okay, at that time. So the stories, for the most part, were accurate. Ibn Ishaq already has already stated not everything in his seerah is accurate, all right, because some of it has not been verified, but a lot of the material has been verified. Well, now I mean, it's, a, it's 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 well established, okay. And I'm, I'm uh, I'll be honest with you, I haven't come across a hadith personally about the the trip to uh, to Abyssinia. But that's because I haven't done that part of my research. However, the, the Muslims did go to Abyssinia. This is well established within Islamic history. I don't believe anyone actually contends this within the academic world, okay? So they went to Abyssinia and they, and they recited the story of Mary to uh, a Najashi, right? That was the name of the king. That was the title of the king. That wasn't his name. So the stories were already present. Most of the stories were already present in the Meccan period. So when you say to me, we go back to this story in, in Surat Saad, you still have to establish, before we go into the story itself, establish to me, A, that Muhammad peace be upon him is the author and not God himself, and B, that um, he heard the story in order to reshuffle the details and put it into his own works. Those are the two things. If you can do that, then you will have a strong ground to stand on. But at the moment, you don't have that. So that's what I'm asking for. I turn it exactly the opposite way. I think you have to establish that... I can do that. That's the thing. I can establish for you that the Qur'an is from Allah. You can't. You can't of course I can. That's your contention that it's from Allah. No, no, no. It's, it's, this is my claim. That's my claim. That's your claim. So I have to back up that claim. See, I wouldn't make a claim. Go on, go, go. Where does the Qur'an... Get the stories from. Yeah, where does it say? Like, the Qur'an doesn't even say that Gabriel gave this to Muhammad. It's not in the Quran. It does. It is in the Quran. Where? So I, I can't remember because I'm. There's, there's one verse that mentions Gabriel giving the word. But it yeah. doesn't even mention Muhammad. Not Muhammad's mentioned. Is no. he mentioned four times in the? By Quran? name. Yeah. By name, he's mentioned four times. He's mentioned uh, other times in, uh, uh, in his ti so, uh, as so how, in his title. How do we even know it's talking okay. about Muhammad? So well, it's it's because in the Quran you can tell when the speech is directed to Muhammad, right? But it's very clear when the speech is directed to Muhammad. So, uh, for example, if I'm, I can't remember the name of the um, the chapter, but Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, um, to give you the the gist of what the Quran is saying, is that um, what do you call it? You are um, uh, Subhanahu wa Taala. Uh, let me find it. Let me find it so I can quote it to you properly, and you can see that it's actually mentioned in the Quran. Give me a second. So sort of the sorry. Um, Surah 16, Surah 16, Surah, 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 uh, No, no, not that one. It says, I know, I know. Whoever is an enemy day for Gabriel, he brings down the revelation to your, to your heart and well as well. So that's the only one that mentions Gabriel. No, it's not. It's not because uh, in this, in the verse I'm thinking of, he's not referred to as Gabriel, he's referred to as one of his titles. Let me see if I can find it. Okay, so here we go. Later, I'm just waiting for it to, to load, inshallah. And okay, so here we go. So this is in chapter 16, verse 102, right? Say, the Holy Spirit has brought it down uh, from your Lord with the truth to reassure the believers and as a guide and good news for those who submit to Allah. So the Holy Spirit is one of the titles of the angel Gabriel in Islam. Ruh al-Qudus. Okay. So what's the verse again? So here we go. So chapter 16, verse 102, right? So he says to the Prophet, right? 
So say the Holy Spirit has brought you down from your Lord with the truth uh, to, uh, to reassure the believers. And there's another one where he's referred to as the mighty one. Uh, but where does it say he's giving this to, to Muhammad? I will show you. Let me just bring it up. So because I, I guess Christians, we believe the Holy Spirit brings God's word to, to the prophets, to Jesus, to, to the disciples. There you go. That, like, it's, really, it's really just Christian teaching. Surah 53, right? Quran it doesn't 53. mention Muhammad Yeah, I know. Well, that's the thing. We have, uh, we have uh, different um, uh, identities for, the whole, for who the Holy Spirit is. Okay, so, so Allah over here says in chapter 53, right, Surah Al-Najm, right, he says about, um, so Allah swears by the stars, right, so by the stars when they fade away, your fellow man is neither misguided nor astray, nor... Oh, sorry, Allah swearing by the stars. Yeah, so when Allah swears by his creation, he's simply signifying the importance of certain aspects of his creation. So Allah swears by time. So to, to, symbol, uh, to tell us the importance of time, you know, so for example, in the short surah, Wal Asr, right? So Allah says, Wal Asr, by time. So that's what he does. So this is how Allah uh, signifies certain important things. So he says here, your fellow man is neither misguided nor astray, nor does he speak of his own whims. It is only a revelation sent down to him. Uh, he has been taught by uh, one uh, of uh, angel in the brackets of mighty power. Right, um, and then he goes on. Right. So, so what? What are we talking about here? Uh, chapter fifty-three. And, and who, who is it talking to? So Allah is addressing us. Okay. So he's addressing us, and he's saying, "Your fellow man." So and he's talking about the prophet peace be upon him. Saying, "Your fellow man is neither misguided nor astray." So chapter fifty-three. From the beginning. Your companion is neither straight or being misled. Nor does he say anything of his own desire. It is no less than an inspiration sent down to him. He was taught by the mighty in power. Now, mighty in power, this is a, this is a title, right? Al-Qawi is a... Um, uh, yeah, so... Al-Limuhu Shadid Al-Quwa. Al-Quwa, right? So... Uh, when, uh, this here, Shadid al Quwa, this is referring to Angel Gabriel. See, you've got sort of multiple interpretations there. First off, I, I find it staggering that, like. No, but this is why, look, he even says God here in Angel. Swear by a star. <laughs> no, but like God, I said, God, God, God promises in his own name in the Old Testament. Like that, that's almost idolatry to swear on a star. No, because we're not. Well, because well, it, it is. <laughs> no, it's not. And. No, like I said, we, we know we know the intent. We know if the intent. Says, I swear by the stars. Then that's no, that's it. That's, that's us. A, that's an idolatry. No, but that's it. for us, right? But so why is God going to swear by His creation? God's going to swear by Himself. So, like I said, the intention here, and this is well known within Islamic exegesis, that when Allah swears by something, right, and He does swear uh, uh, on, on His own power, His own attributes, He does that as well, right. But everything He swears upon. It's to signify its importance. But anyway, that's that's going from besides uh, that's besides the point. So this this is this is proof that Allah actually mentions in the Quran that this is revelation sent down to Muhammad so by by uh, says, through Jibril. But it just says your companion. Yeah. So who who's the one that's uh, being um, uh, con uh, accused of going crazy? It was the Prophet peace be upon him. But how, how, he's been he's been called crazy. That, where do you get that? Who? Where, where do you get that it's talking about the Prophet? So because well look. So when he says, uh, neither uh, astray or being misled, nor does he say anything of his own desire, who else is, w would they be talking about, right? Well, and it, who else would they be talking about? Could he be talking about Jesus? No, because, the, because this is talking about what is being revealed, right? This, is, this revelation, where is it? Uh, it is no less than inspiration sent down to him, right? He was taught by the mighty in power endued with wisdom and so on and so forth, right? So we know who this is speaking about. And, it, and it's with the language of the Quran. So what's it, what, while he was in the highest part of the horizon? Yeah, so this is talking about his um, uh, journey. 
So there's a, there's a lot there. There is a lot there. But I think you read everything. You're reading it into it. It's it's, it's not there. No. Okay. So you're, look, you're, you're natural, no, 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 no. They're not cues, right? For us, this is very explicit because it, obviously it's in the Arabic as well, right? In Nuhu, right? He is is referring to a specific person, right? And when he talks about the Wahi and the angel and everything, we know who this is referring to because. He's speaking to the community as well. He's speaking to the community. Allah is speaking to the community and say, this man, your companion, why is he calling a companion? He's among them, right? He's reassuring the people. This guy is not crazy. He's not been led astray. He's not speaking from his own desire. This is revelation. And, and when, like, even if God's giving him revelation. Like, this is a reassurance what, 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 what? because look, look, Frank, here's the thing, right? For us, right? We believe that Allah has covered all the arguments. Now, look at you. You've come here today saying, well, Allah doesn't even mention that He's revealed this Quran to Muhammad yeah. through the angel Gabriel. But here it is. See, the thing it's is, not. it is. It doesn't mention Muhammad, it, it doesn't no. mention Gabriel. It does. It's just not in the way you expect it to. <laughs> but the thing is, this is the book you're, you're attributing this to God. Yes. So this is going to be the best written book ever. It's going to be the clearest, most perspicuous. It's going to be convincing. I think this is, I think it's mixed oh, okay. up. Like it's, no, next minute, you know, he, he came within two bow lengths. Then he approached and came closer and was a distance of two bow lengths. Yeah. What's he talking about? So this is refer referring to his night journey. Like I said, look, this here, right, you, it's part of, look, part of, what, what's the first step of uh, exegesis of the Qur'an? That you interpret the Qur'an with the Qur'an. Oh, that, right. that's, just, that's how you interpret the Bible. I agree. I agree. That's one of the methods, right? So naturally, when there are ambiguous verses like this, right? See, for us, it's clear. Why? Because we've read chapter 17, where it talks about the night journey. We've read the, uh, the hadith, where the Prophet, peace be upon him, goes up, to, uh, goes up and is actually, as it says here, so close to God, right? And over here, Allah is just a bit more specific, right? He's, he's that, that distance from God, two bow lengths. But see, the night journey, it's so ambiguous what it's talking about. It's, it just says he goes to the furthest see, mosque. See, Allah, Allah, yeah, the furthest mosque, right? So for, uh, for the Muslims, the furthest mosque is in Jerusalem. At the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, that was the only mosque, the only other mosque, right? The Temple of Solomon was considered a mosque but for the believers. There was no temple there, it had been destroyed. It's the grounds, the grounds, are the, the, the grounds is a, a, a thing, right? Temple Mount, or what we now refer to as Temple Mount, okay? That is the site, basically. We're not talking about, we're not talking about Al-Aqsa, which was built way after the, uh, I think 50 years after the Prophet died. Um, we're not talking about that structure. We're talking about the location. It's the location that matters. And, and all it says is he went there. He did go there. And then the, the Hadith then makes the story that he ascended into heaven. Yeah, so he went there. So this is the story, right? So, he went, so we got the, the book from God, and it fails to mention that, and by the way, Muhammad went up and met God face to face and all that. Oh, there, it's, it's not in here. It's it, like the, all the night journeys. You have to remember, the Quran is interpreted in the... Look, and, chapter 3, chapter 3, look, Frank. In chapter 3, Allah has made it very clear that there are verses that are very explicit. Now, these are our creedal, our creedal um, uh, beliefs are explicit and clear within the Qur'an. Then you have what he refers to as Mutashabihad, the ambiguous verses. So Allah is very clear in making you know that there are some things that require interpretation, some stuff that requires clarity. Hence why we have the Sunnah, we have the, the, six, the six categories of uh, interpreting the Qur'an. The first one being the Qur'an with the Qur'an, and then you have the other five, okay? So you need to understand our paradigm to see where we're getting these stories from. But how, you, why we believe, you believe this, this is the word of God, though. Verbatim. And and the hadiths are, they may or may not be the word of God, they're, they're, but they are the words. No, of some of them are the words of God. So we have hadith Qudsi, but which. So, you, so yeah. you need the words of the, the uncertain words of men. No, you need them to they're not the un, the, they're not the uncertain words. This, this is supposed to be the clear word of God. So for example, if you look in Bukhari, in Sahih Bukhari, there's a whole book in it called. Uh, I believe it's a book of commentary, which actually lists down all the hadith where the Prophet, peace be upon him, is he himself interpreting the Quran, right? So this is the interpretation of the Quran by the Prophet, peace be upon him himself, right? And this is in, you can find this in the in the collection of Sahih Bukhari, right? If I'm not mistaken, it's called the book of commentary, right? Or book of prophetic commentary, if I'm not mistaken, okay? Now, then you have the interpretation of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. You have the interpretation of the 
students of the companions of the Prophet peace be upon him. Then you have the Arabic language itself. Can you interpret it this way or that way based on the, upon the Arabic language? Then you have the scholars. So there are, there are various criteria to understand what the Quran is, to, to gain clarity out of those verses which Allah said to you are going to be ambiguous. But, but you believe this book has existed from eternity in the past? Yes. It's been with God? It's been with God, yes. And why couldn't God explain himself? Why, why does he need these things which were... Look, the, way, the way Allah has revealed the book to mankind, I cannot answer. I cannot answer this. Look, to, to me it shows it's, it's not the work of God. And, and the, like the two, two other surahs I was mentioning, Look, 27 and 34, they talk about Solomon. Yeah. And they talk about Solomon having talking birds and genes yeah. and all that. Like in the Bible, Solomon is presented as a great king. He's, he's wise, yes, yes. he's rich. He doesn't have any magic power. Right, but look. But the stories in the Quran, they're, okay. they're, but Frank, they're, they're, you, they're fantasy look, stories. Frank, you're, you are my cousin in faith, right? You're a Christian, right? So you are my cousin in faith. You are a believer in miracles just as much as I am. So we cannot, if, 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 uh, Son if Solomon has been granted the ability to speak to animals, then we, surely we cannot put it down to a magic trick. Well, Would you agree with me that well, no, God has the ability well, to grant Solomon the, the capability of when, communicating when, with elements? When God did miracles, like it's God doing the miracles. So when Moses split the Red Sea, it was God doing it. Right. God, 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 but God, God didn't give Moses a blank check to go around doing magic stuff all the time. No, of course not. But, but in this book, it's like there's... Yeah, even, but look, in the... the he, even the fact that he has jinns working as slaves for him, like mm. it doesn't explain about, you know, how did Solomon get these These are the These are the favours of Allah. See, because how he got this, how he got that, how this happened, how this, Remember, this is a book of guidance, it's not a storybook. We, we, well, some other me, stories, no, but some other stories. To me, they're exactly like a story. No. In, like in a thousand and one But that's because, life, because, they're, because they're Frank, like look, no, but, Fra but Frank, Frank, that's because you've, you've focused your research on the stories within the Quran. Well, yeah, so because, yeah. so be, okay, no, no, fair. So because you've focused on it, that's why it's coming to, across to you as a storybook and not as guidance. If you read it from cover to cover, I don't know if you have, but if you read it and study verse by verse from cover to cover, you will see it's not a storybook. You will see that there are specific aspects of the stories of the prophets that are mentioned in the Quran. The vast majority of the stories of the prophets is actually mentioned outside of the Quran. Right? Which staggers me. Like, I have so why these? So ask yourself, why are these specific elements of the stories of the prophets mentioned in the Quran? I, I asked that question. Right. So what would you think of that? Um, well, I, I think, to me, it's just that Muhammad's heard these stories, and so he, or Muhammad or whoever put it together, okay. has heard these stories, and they sound like good stories. And he, he's put it in his recitation. Whereas, so you think so it's? I, I so you? So you believe it's on the whim of a person who thought it was? It was a nice story to, uh, to yeah, include. Yeah, okay. Because, um, they, so to me, they don't have a spiritual. Thing. So you don't believe there is a lesson within them? No, no. Um, like, yeah, what, what's the lesson oh. in um, that, that Solomon says? You know, it'd be nice to go and get her throne of Sheba, and the jinn says, "Oh, you know, I can bring." No one says, "I can bring it back quickly." No one says, "I can get it in a blink of an eye," and they, and suddenly the, the, you know, they stole the throne from Sheba, bring it back, and these are the tricker. You think, well, what's that got to do with the acts of God? You know, like. God in the Old Testament is, you know, divide, he's, he's dividing the sea to save Israel. He's healing people. You know, th those are miracles. It's not about tricking people. With, no, that was a competition what, between what, between the jinn on who can bring the throne back. What jinn? It's just something pops up in the Quran and. Like, jinn would be, like the Hindus would just call them gods. Well, yeah, the Hindus will call anything gods, to be honest. Yeah, but so, but no, to me, it's just, it's just, it's just fable. No, okay, well, like, to the, you, it's... The Old, the old Testament, you to, think it tells these stories... Uh, I, I would I would not even say that maybe the Old Testament maybe exaggerates his wealth a bit or something like that. Mm. But it just tells the story of a man who was wealthy and rich and was a great king. But it doesn't say anything about magic tricks or anything like that. Oh, okay. why, why, would, why, yeah, would but, the, why would the Jews not say but would Solomon you, had all these powers? Okay. If, if it was, well, I said, my, my concern is not with the with the Bible. I, I could comment on it and why, why possibly this, why possibly that. My focus is on the Quran because you're here to talk about the Quran. Yeah, yeah. Okay? So there are lessons that we take away from the thing. So for example, one of the biggest, um, so when it comes to Solomon and the jinn, right? The jinn didn't believe that they could be subdued by anyone, right? So what does Allah do? 
right? He proves them wrong, and he proves them again wrong because the, the jinn also. Where does believe, the idea that the jinn believe that come from? Is it, because is it the jinn, all right. So the jinn are what do you call it? They are obviously more powerful beings than us, right? They are from the unseen world, and they have they have greater power, right? So there is an arrogance among them, right? And we even see that, uh, we see that very clearly from the Quran when it comes to the death of, of Solomon. And I know you brought this up because I've been watching the Iftawa stream, so you come on, right? I've actually, we've actually communicated on email, by the way. You, you don't actually remember me, but we've communicated on email. What's your name? Uh, Al-Yemeni. Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. The, the Yemen the Yemenite front. Yeah. Yes. So, <laughs> So, it's not... No, I, I would never clear you on emailing up and down. That's fine, it's not a problem. Was that rude to you? No, 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 you'll be fine. No, no. <laughs> Some people have been rude to you. <laughs> yeah, it's not, no, you'll be fine. Um, so, you know, you were talking about the, when, you know, uh, what's, the, what's the significance of when Solomon dies on his stick, you know? Well, the jinn thought that they had knowledge of the unseen. This is one of the things that they thought they were superior in, that they had knowledge of the, of the unseen. Right, and this is where fortune telling stuff. Does the Quran actually say that? Does yes, it, it because that? actually in Surah Al Jinn, if I'm not mistaken, it speaks about um, when the jinn used to climb on top of each other to hear the whispers of the of the angels and the discussions of what's going to happen and this and that, and then they will bring it down. So the, uh, the whole uh, the whole science of fortune telling, when you go to uh, fortune telling, actually comes from this this uh, belief that you commune with the jinn who have knowledge of of the of the future because they've heard it from what's happening in, happening in the heavens, all right? Uh, so when we see in the Quran about the angels uh, throwing uh, stones at the angel, at the jinn, it's to stop them from hearing things of the, of the future oh, honestly, and stuff that, like that. Doesn't that sound like Look, legendary stuff to you? Anything miraculous, right? Or anything from the unseen will sound fantastical if you don't believe that God can create a world that we cannot see where these things operate. I mean, if, if, this is a, if these are supernatural beings, yeah. why are the angels going to throw stones? Don't, you know, don't they have something better than stones? Well, we, we call right. Look, Allah says to, that they are stones. The nature of these stones could be different to, the, to, a, to a pebble that we see on the earth. We're not saying, we're not saying that this. It's likewise when we say about Allah having, having a hand. We don't mean he's got five fingers and a palm. Right? Just because we use a terminology, we're not making like for like by necessity. Okay? So, but it's terminology that we as human beings can understand. Right? Something's being thrown at them. Okay? So, like I said, look, you as a Christian, as a cousin in faith, you can appreciate the fact that God can create and have things happen as He wills. Right? Regardless of how fantastical they sound, you surely believe this. That despite the, uh, how fantastical it sounds, it could be a reality because God is capable of having this yeah, things but occur. Honestly, God, God, God's intervention are relatively rare, and they're for a very clear purpose. No, they're, no. They're, they're not. Like, but this not is an assumption. A, they're not to give a man these supernatural powers, which would have made him the most powerful man in history. Well, the and thing yet, is, and yet there's you, no, there's no well, well, Solomon actually made a, a prayer to Allah. He said, he asked him. He said. Grant me a kingdom for which no kingdom has uh, uh, was before, and no kingdom will exist afterwards. So this is a this is a request from Solomon to God, you know, asking for this, and God grants it to his prophet. So to for him to have such a vast kingdom, when you understand that detail, it's not strange anymore to have these to have the uh, abilities that enable him to control his kingdom from far. To, to be able to have the jinn to go to the edges of his kingdom in, in such a fast thing because at the end of the day he's going to have a kingdom that no one will ever see before uh, that no one has seen before and no one will ever see upon this earth see, the interesting thing about what, does this make sense to you now that there's more details not really like, see what the story that the bible tells about Solomon was that he he prayed for wisdom and because he prayed like, um, when he becomes king he yes. prays for wisdom yeah. and um, you know, like he says, you know, you've shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you. He continued his kindness. He says, now Lord God, you've made your servant king, uh, your servant king in place of my father David. Mm. But I'm only a little child and I do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you've chosen. Grant my appeal. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. Yeah. 
for who is able to govern the great people of yours? And the, and the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you've asked for this, and not for long life or wealth or for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked, and I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that you'll never have anyone like you, nor will there ever be... No, sorry, yeah. read it again. So there I is will a give you a wise and discerning yeah. heart so that there will never be, never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both riches and honour, so that in your lifetime you will, there will be no equal among kings. Yeah. You will you'll have no equal among kings. So it actually says he didn't ask for anything except for wisdom. Yeah. And because he asked for wisdom, God was pleased with him and gave him, gave him all gave his him riches. Riches in the kingdom. But he doesn't say right. about right, but the natural it's okay. powers. And no, of course. Oh, look, the thing is, we, like, as you know, Muslims don't uh, completely condemn the Bible. We believe there is some truth within it, right? Now, for, for is, it, um, is it plausible that uh, Solomon asked for wisdom? Uh, peace be upon him, of course, right? But one, but here's the thing, right? One of the one of the qualities of the prophets is that they are wise. So remember, God chooses these people based on who they are in order to carry His message and propagate His message. So one of these characteristics is wisdom. So naturally, Solomon would be wise, but Allah increases them in wisdom, in intellect, and all of that to help them with their message, and of course, give them their uh, the, the the favors. And the, and the miracles to go with it to be more evident to the people that they preach to. So, there are aspects of the Bible that, uh, that uh, align with the Quran and there are some aspects but not. Where do we as Muslims draw the line? Remember, our belief and our claim is that Allah is the author of the Quran, which means that He is the primary witness to the events that has happened in the Old Testament. So what he tells us has happened and what Solomon has asked for or what happened to Abraham when he was placed in the fire or what happened to um, um, uh, Moses, uh, what do you call it, when he received the Torah, right? Or the tabernacle or any of these stories. We say that is 100% true because God is the primary witness of these events. So what is related to us through his word verbatim must be true. And that is our claim. So for, for you to demonstrate that, you're, that the stories are wrong, you have to actually deconstruct the claim that Allah is the author. We have to go back to that step. And this is where I say that like, there's a, quite a simple natural explanation for how, how all these stories came to be. But, but, you, but it's conjecture. You, but Would you, you admit it's conjecture? Well, but, but you, you've got to make the claim that, no, no, uh, Muhammad didn't get these just by listening to what people are saying, and yeah. that he actually specifically got them from the angel Gabriel. Yes, but then, which I showed you in the Quran. But then the Quran is pretty. It doesn't really say that he got them from Gabriel. It does. Look into look into that chapter fifty three, yeah, the first say, the first five verses. But it doesn't. Along the mind, it doesn't mention Muhammad, and, and that's why it doesn't mention him by name. I agree. It doesn't mention uh, uh, angel Gabriel by name. You know, is. But look, like I said, like I said to you earlier in the conversation, Muhammad, peace be upon him, he's mentioned four times by name. The other times he's mentioned as Nabi, Rasul, right, and, and among other titles, right? Right? Rahmatan lil alameen, right, a mercy to mankind. That's the title that is given to him, right? You are a mercy to mankind. This is a title given to him. It's referring to him. So not always will he be referred to by name. So like I said, look, obviously when you go, how long are you in the UK for, by the way? How about just a week. Just a week. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, that's fair enough. Yeah. Be back for a while after that. No, that's fine. That's fine. Um, but you know, have a look at chapter 53, right? And look at how Muslims have come to the to acknowledge the identities of Gabriel and and Muhammad peace be upon him in those in those in those five verses, right? Look into it. And I know you're capable of that research. I am. But I, I know. I, I, I'm not doubting it. <laughs> but the thing is, yeah. it's, everything seems so vague. Whereas when you read the New Testament, you read the teaching of Jesus. He gets straight to the point and he's, te he's but teaching not, people. But we know that's not the case because he speaks in parables, right? Oh, but it's but, but so, the, so he I agree, the I, I agree. But the prophet, peace be upon him, explained uh, ambiguous verses to the, to the people as well. The Muslims understood who was being referred to in, in the Quran. So it wasn't, it wasn't left ambiguous, right? The Muslims today haven't discovered that this is referring to Muhammad and, Je and, and, uh, and uh, uh, peace be upon him and Gabriel. Right, because of some 
academic work. No, it's because it's been explained there and then. But don't, don't you think, when, like a, when a book has a main message, it's important, it's going to focus on those things and it's going to mention that. So if Muhammad is really the prophet of God, then I would expect the, the Quran's going to make it, it's going to make it very clear that Muhammad's bringing this message and that he's got it from Gabriel. It does. And yet it seems to be so convoluted and, and yet, and I find stories which... Have a look at it. Just, just, but I find stories in the Quran let, which it's quite, like it's, it, it's, it's quite possible that uh, he heard them from other people. Right, Possi the possibility still uh, re uh, denotes conjecture. Well, now, I, no, 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 look, I'm saying, look, it's fine to have that opinion if you want to ha hold that opinion. But at the same time, you've been you, you've been looking at these stories for a while so it's become more than a more than a, a, a curious thing it's all, you're making the claim let's be honest you are making the claim that the stories are made up by whoever the author is right and I, I, if i'm not mistaken you believe that muhammad peace be upon him is the author so this is something you have to establish you have to show that um he is the author of the quran then you have to show that he has heard the stories in order to manipulate the stories well see and that's where it gets to, to me, it's even more complicated than that because it's actually very. It the, is that the, simple. The Quran does go, like, you know, it, is, it goes back to the early seventh century. Naturally, yeah. Is it talking about Muhammad, or is it? Did it actually start with a kind of a Christian sect, which was, and which is eventually adapted into? Look, you can you can go you can go into the Muhammad mythicist ideas. You can go into into the into the into the, into the Syriac stuff and. You know, yeah. look, yeah. I know where your arguments are coming from, but Frank, I, I want to respect the fact that you know better. Well, no, um, I, I, cause you, you're no, telling me. You know better that the, that, that, that the histories of Muhammad, peace be upon him, not existing, or the fact that the Quran was written in the Syriac Aramaic language, right, initially in the fifth century, you know that these um, uh, claims hold no weight. Like all scholars who, who study the ancient languages acknowledge that there's a large influence of Syriac on the Quran. The very word Quran means a homily. There was a guy called Jacob of Saru who lived a century before Muhammad. And he, he was a you know a Christian preacher and he wrote in he, he composed the, his poetry and he has these things, like, it's called homilies where uh, a homily is kind of a sermon yeah. which is it's not so much doctrinal but it's it's giving you a story, an uplifting, a spiritually uplifting story. For example, the story of Joseph. He yeah. tells that, like he retells stories from the Bible, and that's a, those things are called a homily. Yeah. And the and the word for that is Quran. So I think Quran comes from the Syriac homily. No, see, because the thing is, within the Quran, we know where the foreign words are. Quran is not. Quran is actually from the root word Qara, uh, uh, right? Or, Qaf, Ra, Elif, right? The three, the, the triliteral roots, right? That's where it comes from. It's an Arabic word. Yeah. That's where it comes from. And what does it mean? To recite. However, it goes a bit deeper because when you look into the foundations of the science or uh, ulum al Quran, it actually explains it in a bit more depth because in the Quran, it actually explains in detail uh, in a couple of verses that the Quran is something that is partitioned, right? Collected and recited to the people, what right? So because the Quran, how was the Quran uh, revealed? It was revealed in parts, right? In partitions, a couple of verses here, a short chapter here, a segment here, right? Throughout the 23 years, it wasn't plopped down as a book, right? So and does the Quran say that? Yes, right? Let me bring it up for you, right? Because it's, no, so I'll actually bring it up for you. It's on my Dropbox, so I don't know if it will load my Reception is actually horrible. Actually, no, sorry, it's not on my Dropbox. Um, where is it? Where is it? Okay, here we go. Let me just let have this load up quickly, and I'll tell you. Uh, okay. So in these two verses, this, this tells you exactly what the Qur'an means, right? So the meaning of the word Qur'an, by the way, I wrote this uh, on, based on research. So the meaning of the word Qur'an is derived from the triliteral root Qara'a, uh, you know, Q-R-A. And the fa'al or verb, meaning to collect, portion, read and recite. 
However, we have to bear in mind that the word uh, Quran means to recite uh, through, uh, though its roots expands on its meaning. In essence, the Quran is the revelation from Allah sent down in portions, which is recited and read, which has uh, been collected in the hearts as, well, as we see in the following verses. So in this verse he says, and it is a Quran which we have separated by intervals that you might recite it to the people over a prolonged period. And we have sent it down progressively. And the other verse is this one. Indeed upon us is the collection in your heart and to make possible its recitation. This is the actual meaning of the word Quran. So it's not a foreign word, it's, a, it's an Arabic word which carries all of that meaning. So that's how rich the word Quran actually is. No, 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 no. Let it, let it, let it. Let it, let it, let it. 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 Let it, as it was being revealed. So as soon as it was revealed, after, after it was, as soon as the Prophet, peace be upon him, would recite it, it would be written down. There would be a scribe well, present. But, I mean, that's not and it was collected. That's not universally taught by Muslims. You have to remember, the majority of Muslims are laymen, right? Look at the sources. You will see that it's within every source. But isn't the, isn't the story that uh, it was, um, Zaid, Zaid ibn Harith, yeah. And when, when he was told to write down the Quran, he said he was but most nervous about doing because he said the Prophet would never do this. Do no, 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 no. Okay, you, you mix it up a little. Be, you mix it up. No, you actually no. That was actually Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. He was a bit nervous about doing it because he. Because what we have is bid'ah, right? Bid'ah is innovation in the religion. Now, because the Prophet peace be upon him never collated the Quran into a into a uniform book. The, uh, Abu Bakr was a bit hesitant. He was like, the Prophet peace be upon him didn't put it into a book form. So why should I? I don't want to do what the Prophet peace be upon him did. So Omar uh, radiallahu anhu, he, he convinced him. How did he convince him? Because he said, this is not bid'ah. This is not an innovation because Allah himself refers to the Quran as a book. Yeah, it's, it's in Surah Al-Baqarah, right? This is a clear book for which there is no doubt. Second, uh, second verse of uh, chapter two, yeah? Um, so he, so he's telling him this is not this is not an innovation. The Quran has always meant to be in a book form, right? But obviously, revelation kept coming. The Rasulullah couldn't put it into a book form while it's still being revealed. So naturally, the revelation has to be has to cease prior to it being put form. So Zaid ibn Harith, he was the person put in charge of the of the project to collate the the written as well as the recited verses. So they will get two two written copies of each verse and two people who have memorized each verse. All right, and, and, and that was the verification method. And only then would it be transcribed into the codex of Abu Bakr. And then that was, you know, uh, what do you call it? That was the master copy from which the Orthomani code, uh, code, codices uh, came from. So we know 114 chapters exist. And that's what it is. But like all, all those the stories that describe that come from much later, and then and even then. Sorry, sorry, the, I, I didn't, I didn't understand the story, that. The story tells you that the that copy was put under a bed for pillow, the, 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 the pillow of Hassa. For, for more than ten years, wasn't it? Before, before um, Uthman uh, wanted to create the um, fourteen years. So, so, so the Uthmanic Codice were written in six forty eight. Um, Abu Bakr commissioned this in 632. Uh, so you're 16 years. So it just seems odd to me that this Quran, like after going all the trouble putting it together, it then goes under a bed. It, no, no one is saying that it's, that's it. It was transcribed and stuck under the bed. No. When, when it came to the codices, see, because you're getting the, you're, from the narration, it just says it was retrieved from under the pillow of Hafsa, right? That doesn't mean it was always there. It just means that's where it was when it was retrieved. All right? Let's not conflate the two. So it's, 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 uh, yeah? So, and, and the, the question is, why is the, why was the Uthman codices required? Because obviously at that point, Islam spread to the people who the Arabs refer to as Ajam. 
Ajam means mute, right? Now, obviously, they weren't actually mute, but for the Arabs, they were like, if you don't speak the Arabic language, you're like a, you're, you're like a mute, right? So they were referred as to Arjum. So because of that, because they were now non-Arabs and stuff, so there was a need for, for the codices to be done and actually uh, spread across the, um, the, uh, the empire, as well as have the, uh, what do you call it? And then obviously the, the diacritical marks were introduced as well to facilitate ease of those people who were learning the Quran. So, so this is what it was, right? This is the history of the Quran. But the roots here, for you to be able to go through the stories as mere fables, you have to deconstruct the Muslim claim that it comes from Allah. Challenge that claim, deconstruct that claim, and your point will make itself. And, and my, my claim is that even the Quran itself does not clearly say, state that it's all from Gabriel. Like, how, how do you sort out? Well, it's not from Gabriel, it's from Allah. Yeah. For, to, uh, Allah's and, and, and I say, when I read it, and I read these stories, I think, well, this is just this is typical of stories like Alibaba or Sinbad the Sailor. It's, it's not. Oh, no, you can actually say that Alibaba and Sinbad and even Aladdin drew stories from the Quran. You know, the flying, uh, the flying rug. Right? Draw it from. Uh, well, it's, it's, to me, it's at the same level. It's, it's, no, but this is the thing is, still, stop thinking about these things as magic tricks simply because they come from a different faith. Like I said, you and I both believe in God, you and I both believe in miracles. Give the Quran the credit where it's due of its own claim that it comes from God and God can, uh, can perform me, these miracles. The, these, what you're calling miracles, do not, permit, do not befit the glory of God. They seem to be just. The sort of tricks yeah, but with, res but with respect, uh, Frank, your opinion of what uh, befits the glory of God and my opinion of what befits the glory of God doesn't matter, does it? God does as He wills. Would you not agree? Yeah. yeah right. I, I so if He does as He wills, right, even if He decided to have a rainfall of, of, uh, of oranges, doesn't mean anything. It, couldn't, it could, might not have any significance to us, but He did it. Well, my, my God doesn't act like that. No. But my, my God acts with purpose and uh, so does mine it, it so does mine it, it but look whether we see the purpose or the intent or the wisdom behind it is irrelevant the fact is we have to have trust in God that he has acted with wisdom because he is it all wise he doesn't play with his creation well, that, that story about stealing the throne all that seems like he is playing with his creation. no it, 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 to me, no. to me the, the throne. Remember, Allah promised. Uh, what do you call it? He granted the the request, uh, the supplication of Solomon to have the greatest kingdom. So naturally, things that would happen, like bringing the the throne in a blink of an eye, this will you will never see. So this is part of his wisdom to grant Solomon what he asked for. Well, to me, that is that a plausible explanation? No. Sorry, to, to Sorry me, brother. It, it, it just reads like. Fairy stories. Okay. It's the same as fairy stories. Yeah, but you have. All right. All right. Look, Frank. Because I know you've been doing this, I want you to try and look at it from a different angle. Try and look at it from the Muslim perspective, because right now you're looking at it as a crit as a as a as a critic, which is fine, right? I, I like. Obviously, we we invite the criticism of the Quran, because that's what could potentially lead you to the truth. However, look at it in the eye uh, from the lens of a Muslim. Read the Quran as a whole, because. If you read things, uh, uh, if you just focus on the stories, that's all you're going to see. But we, look, if you, look at what Jesus says in the Bible. Like we've got you know, these whole chapters of you know, Jesus speaking, which is, to me, that's teaching. And, it's, and the whole Quran is a teaching. It's, it's vastly different to what the Quran Yeah, but the Quran is entirely teaching. The, the whole Quran is, is teaching. In fact, here's the thing, right? You were talking about clarity of what Allah wants. Now we know, obviously you know that Muslims, what do we prioritize the most? Tawheed, right? Say la ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. This is what we prioritize. Now there is a scholar called Ibn Qayyim, rahimullah. Now he mentioned that there is not a single verse of the Quran where Tawheed is not present, where the teaching of Tawheed is not present. Unfortunately to most Muslims, it goes by them. They don't actually realize this because they haven't studied. And likewise, I would invite you to do, to do the same. Study and see where the message of the oneness of God is in every single verse, right? And we can commune, you know, you're going to go back to Israel. We can connect online, it's not an issue. And I can go through because I was uh, delivering a, uh, 
a quick, you know, like a speech or a mini lecture among some people. And I asked them, I gave them some homework and I said to them, go away and find me a verse which seemingly does not um, uh, speak about Tawheed, bring it to me and then tell me how it does actually teach about Tawheed, right? And they brought a couple of things and we went through them, right? But there is, Islam is quite deep, right? Like I said, every single verse contains Tawheed in it. So read it from that perspective, right? Read it and see where the teachings are. Don't just look at the stories because then you're isolating the Quran to something it's not intended for. So now you're going away from the intention of the author. So, and naturally, if you, want, if you want to understand the purpose of a book, we want to understand the intent of the author. And because you've, you've concentrated so much of these, on these stories, you've deviated from the intent of the author. So return to the intent of the author and you'll gain more clarity on not only the teachings, but the wisdoms behind the stories as well. Because as you know, the, Quran, the stories are scattered. They're not, you don't have like a, a section about Moses and a section about Abraham. You have Moses, then Abraham, then Noah. Then you have again Noah, Abraham. It's all over, right? Which, I, which to me, that's not, right. not a virtue. <laughs> right, so then ask yourself, why are they placed in these places? Why, are, why is this specific story here? How does it correlate with the surrounding verses which aren't stories? These are the questions. And this, you will grow in wisdom, you'll grow in understanding, and you'll, and you'll start to ask yourself, why do Muslims actually believe this? That's my advice to you. Because five o'clock, I'm going to head off. That's fine. So it's, it's been, I, I have enjoyed talking to you. It's been a good Likewise. conversation. Likewise. Uh, I don't know if we've made much progress, but it's been, yeah. it's been a good no. conversation. I, but that's my, look, once, so that, that's, that's my advice. That's my advice to you. Okay. okay. And, um, um, and I just ask you to think about the things too. So, yeah. Look, every time I'm always in a constant, uh, constant state of self reflection. Yeah. My arguments against the Bible and the Christian doctrine, I reflect on it. Before I even make the argument, I always ask myself, does this argument make sense? Are there holes in my argument? What would be the rebuttals? Does the rebuttal make sense? You know? So that's why that's how I approach my studies. I try to put myself in Christian shoes. Why do they understand it? So I ask you to do the same. I'm not asking you to do anything I wouldn't do. Okay, Frank? Listen, it was a pleasure. It's great to see you in person. We'll talk we'll sometime. See ya. I don't know if I will be back for a long time, but anyway. But hey, yeah. We might meet again. No worries. All right. So, Alhamdulillah. Oh. It's long, long, long time. Alhamdulillah, but I, inshallah he's sincere enough to, to go away and think about what I've said. But we'll see, we'll see. Because he's on live streams often with the Muslims. Oh, yeah, absolutely, honestly. Yeah. I didn't get one single sniff of sincerity. Inshallah. For me, it look it, it, from, for me. It looked like he started to think, but I think those bits where you thought he started to think, yeah, was where his argument was obviously breaking down, yeah, and he was having to reevaluate. Yeah, that's what he was doing. But that's the thing. At least, at least, there's a reevaluation there. But whether he goes back to his sincerity, Allahu Alam. I ask Allah for his guidance. But Allah will guide him if he's sincere. Allah. I do not need to worry for him. If he's sincere, I don't need to worry. And if he's insincere, I don't need to worry. I need to worry about myself <laughs> and what I'm gonna what I'm gonna say to Allah. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, I They don't take it seriously. They have to, you know, the person who is coming here to argue. Yeah. You have to study a lot. Yeah. That's what they say sometimes. The person is like half year, half day, half year. It's yeah. not them that needs to study. It's us as well. Apologies for. Uh, ah, you. no problem, bro. No problem. In, that's uh, fine. That's fine. That's fine. It's no problem. You have a much better way of handling these people than I do. Kalas, yeah. Nam. Done.